Well, good morning and welcome. It's good to be here. It's nice to have all of you here. I think we're building up some of the views a little better. It's nice to see. And we have, if I'm on my best behavior this morning, <laughs> it's because the place is riddled with clergy this morning. <laughs> some of them are incognito, some of them aren't, but I'm very glad to have them here. Uh, and uh, it's kind of nice, nice to have a crowd of any time. So welcome to all of you, the regulars and the irregulars and the visitors and you folks. Let me then go back to that good behavior thing again. But in any case, I'm very glad to have you here. Most of what you need for your service is in the bulletin, and if you need to have a green book and a blue game book in, uh, available to you. For those of you who are new to what, new with us this morning, we don't pass the plate at the off door. So if you have an offering, put it in the plate in the back on the way in, so that rather than pass it around. And you'll notice some people wearing masks, some people not wearing masks. At the moment, I say we're kind of like the co-op. It's not required, but it's recommended. So, so I'll let you make your decision as to how you feel around that. It's still a nasty bug. You still don't want to get it. So we'll, we'll do what we can. On that note, our opening sentence. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. O come, let us worship. Our opening hymn in the Blue Hymn Book, number 499, How Firm a Foundation.
new books, the books of alternative services, on page 185. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, in you all our hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray as Paulus for this week, for the twelfth Sunday after Pentecost is in the bulletin. We pray together, author and giver of all. find in me that they went far from me, and went after worthless things, and became worthless themselves. They did not say, Where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that no one passes through, where no one lives? I brought you into a plentiful land to eat its fruit and its good things. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, Where is the Lord? Those who handled the law did not know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The prophesies prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, once more I accuse you, says the Lord, and I accuse your children's children. Cross to the coasts of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedar and examine with care. See if there has ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for something that does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. The word of the Lord. The psalm for today is in the bulletin. The congregation's part is in gold. Psalm 81. Sing with joy to God our strength and raise a loud shout to the God of Jacob. I am the Lord your God. And Israel would not obey me. So I gave them a word to the sovereigns of their hearts to follow their own devices. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I should choose a few enemies and turn my hands into their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him, and their punishment would last forever. But Israel will I feed with eyes of salt and satisfy me with honey from the rock. We pray together, Father, forgive our foolish ways and feed us always to that living bread which is given for the life of the world. Your Son of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
second reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 to 8, 15 and 16. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured as though you yourself were being tortured. Let marriage be held in honour by all, and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled, for God will judge fornicators and adulterers. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through him then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thank Thanks you, God. Our gradual hymn is not actually our firm foundation that we already sang. I got the number right, but the name wrong. Number 544 is in fact, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. So that's what we're going to sing. Stand together and sing number 544, and we remain standing for the gospel reading of Paul.
Jesus Christ. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed that the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, in case they may invite you in return, and you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot be paid, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Speak to the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to show my age with this first uh, story. A number of years ago, when I did such things, I went to a concert in Montreal, and it was Burton Cummings. Now, that shows I'm not quite as old, because it wasn't a guess who, it was Burton Cummings. <laughs> But as is often the case, when you're waiting for the concert to start, and it was about, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes after the, the, uh, the show was supposed to begin, there are various people coming on and off stage, and they bring a guitar up and put it down here, and somebody would come out and move a mic stand around, and, and some guy, a kind of scruffy looking guy with a baseball hat, sat down and moved a few things around, and then he started to play the piano. And of course that was... That was Burton Cummings, and I thought it was a wonderful entrance because nobody was even really paying attention at that point. And all of a sudden, there he was playing. Now, I'm sure I don't want to over interpret what the point was of that, and it was kind of fun and kind of a cute way to start. And I don't suppose he's a particularly humble guy, I don't know, he might be, he's from Winnipeg, but I don't know if that helps. <laughs> but we have expectations of people and of situations and we have in certain circles we have to we think this is what's going to happen and so the fact that he kind of usually at a concert when you go to see somebody they they have an opening act and they you know nobody really cares about the opening act except their relatives and friends and and then and then they have a guy from a local radio station comes out and does a little whip them up and yells the name of the person and then it starts so it's kind of fun to see some of those rules being broken a little bit. And, and I thought it was a nice way to begin. Now, that does eventually connect to the reading, so we'll see if it does by the end. But we start, actually, in many ways, this morning, in, in the courtroom. And a familiar place for some of you, perhaps less for others, and you don't have to tell me in what way you know it, um, unless you need to. But it begins in the courtroom, and the prophet Jeremiah describes a situation in which the people of Israel are being put on trial. And God, who is in this reading, is functioning as both the accuser and as the judge, is clearly finding them lacking. So the counts against them are spelled, are spelled out. They, the people have strayed from God. The people have followed worthless idols and have so become worthless themselves. They have forgotten the God that brought them out of Egypt and led them through the wilderness in safety and brought them to a good land. 
and they have defiled that promised land, and even their priests do not seek the will of God or God's presence among the people. And it really boils down to two things, as it says in verse 13. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And although the scene described is a courtroom and they're clearly been finding wanting, I think it's really important to notice that speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, God is not really interested in condemning the people. That's not why God made those promises to Abraham and Sarah. That's not why God raised up a people. That's not why God led them from bondage in Egypt to this, to this rich and fertile land. What God wants is for God's people to prosper. God wants them to live. God, and so in effect, the point of, of Jeremiah here, as in so many of the messages of the prophets, are smart enough, you know better. It takes even more words than that. But that's, most of the time, that's the gist of it. That they may know more of the life that God had in mind for them, that God still has in mind for them. And to, to refer off the refer to the, to the gospel reading, God wants them to, to join in the feast, whoever they are. And all we have to do is accept what God is offering. Now, it sounds easy, and at some level it is, but as most of us here will know, it's, it's not actually that easy to really make it happen. The land of Israel at the time of Jeremiah was much like the land of Israel in the time of Jesus, or much like, well, pretty well anywhere at any time, really, despite some individual variations in the particulars. Most people in those days, like most people now, work hard for a living. They married, they raised families, they saw it as best they were able, a, a piece of the pie, as we might say. Some had more of it, some had less of it. But the basic dynamics of a society of people probably haven't changed that much over time. The problem is that the things that we do and the things that we end up believing and the things that drive our lives in that setting often conflict with the fact that we are actually, and all people are, made in God's image. And we have a destiny, we have a purpose we have things that we're to be working for, things that are to be the goal in our lives that are very different than those of society. So the sins of Israel that Jeremiah is addressing really come down to those two things. They forgot God and God's goodness. They got into the land of Egypt, think of Israel rather, things started to go well and, and as is often the case, when things are going well, we think, oh, I must be pretty smart. I must be pretty hard. I'm, they're lucky to have me here. Look how much, look how much I have. Look how many vineyards I have, or houses, or whatever. And they started to rely on their own efforts, their own ideas, their own behavior to live lives. They were, in the words of Jeremiah, relying on cisterns that they made themselves. Now, this is the, how hard could this be? Dig a hole in the ground, put water in it, right? Well, I think it's harder than that. I've never dug a cistern. I imagine with all the rocks around here, that would be a lot of work. That's why people use those big plastic things. But they relied on what they could do themselves rather than on the living waters, the things that God had provided for them. And when you're doing well, that's tempting. And it's not that different now. Again, the details sound different, the words are different. I don't think the basic reality is any different. We allow the expectations, the way the society around us works, and our nature as physical creatures to, to call the shots to decide, help us in deciding what we're going to do, what we're not going to do, the things we're going to devote our energies to. And in doing that, if we're not careful, if we're not paying attention, we miss out on the fullness of life 
that God wants us to be experiencing, that God created us for in the first place. We're pretty good at this time in history. We're, you know, at collecting and we're good at technology. Some of us work hard. We're, we got some pretty good things that we can do a pretty good job without God being involved. But it's really a sad thing when we do that. Because that's, God wants to be involved. God wants to be at the core of our lives, not all that other stuff. And so from time to time, every three years in the lectionary, but from time to time, we need to be reminded of that. We need it to be called on it in the way that Jeremiah calls the people of Israel. We need to give our head a shake. We need to get a, a whatever in the rear end from time to time. We, we got to be reminded sometimes that it's easy and tempting to kind of slide off in that direction away from what God wants for us. In the Gospel reading, Jesus he talks about a, a dinner party being held by some prominent Pharisee. And, and, and you know, some of us have been fortunate to be at dinners at at, at nice people's houses. The one time I remember when I was at McGill, I got invited to a long boring the details later. We got to, a bunch of us got to go to dinner at the principal's house. And the principal at McGill University later became the governor general. So he had a very nice house at the top of West Mount, if you've been to Montreal. So this is a very odd place. And we're sitting there eating our meal, and the lady sitting beside me had been an editor of the McGill student newspaper. And as student newspapers have always been, she spent most of her life saying horrible things about the principal and, and, and how awful he was and how terrible he was and how he was oppressing everybody. I don't think that's changed over the centuries. And she said to me, I'm really embarrassed. I said, well, why? She did, did not strike me as someone who embarrassed easily. She said, my mother was a church lady. She grew up, you know, she brought me up to be polite. And here I am and said all these horrible things about this man. And he's been nice to me. And he knows who I am. <laughs> but there is, again, those expectations, right? That, that are part of that. And part of the expectation that we have at those sort of events is that the important people get to be important at them. I'm embarrassed to say as clergy, and some of you will know this, there's a seat for me. I remember we had the... the the last service we did at the old church in Great Valley, Alberta, before we deconsecrated it and moved to the new church. And the place was jammed. It was wonderful. We had about 140 people at a church that maybe sat 90. They were in layer like sardines. I had half the church to myself. It felt kind of funny. I wasn't going to invite them to come up and sit on altar rail. I'm pretty sure that wouldn't work. But there's an expectation about how this works. And the important people get to be identified as important. But what Jesus is saying is the important people to God aren't the ones you think they are. The society may have said the priest or the mayor or the person paying the bill or whoever it is, principal, whoever it is, they're they're more important. And so they get to sit at the nice seats. And Jesus is saying, don't, you're wrong. Everyone is important. Especially the ones that have been looked down on, that have been downtrodden, the ones that are in the highways and the byways, the beggars, the, the thieves, the prostitutes, you name it. The ones that we feel awkward if they came in here. You know what they are. Those are the ones that are important. And the way we behave needs to show that. So it's not just... And, and so as the story continues, part of the point Jesus is making is that God's love and God's grace and God's embrace is much broader than we can expect it to be. Much broader than we can imagine. They're more than we can ask or imagine, as we say at the end of the service. We need to remember that from time to time. 
You know, most of the time the people who come to church here are, they're nice people. They're, they're good folks. You know, they're, they're ones that we're happy to have here. And, and I'm glad. Well, I'd like to think I'd be happy if anybody showed up. But we need to be reminded sometimes to pay attention to who isn't here. And why they aren't here. And maybe there are ways we can make them know that they're welcome here. And part of that is knowing ourselves that we actually would welcome them if they showed up. Because that's not something we can always take for granted. But the passage from the Gospel is a path that called to go beyond what we would normally expect to do. Just like in the concert that I mentioned at the beginning. You know, you know how concerts start? Well, sometimes they don't. Sometimes the musicians are, are not the guy that gets the big welcome and the big pizzazz and the spotlight. It's just the guy with the t-shirt and the baseball cap on and suddenly starts singing. And you realize, oh, okay. This is a bit of a mixed message, I have to admit. You know, because, well, as you go to a, a, a banquet, don't sit in a fancy seat, sit at the, at the far end. Because if you're sitting at the far end, then they'll come up to you, maybe they'll come up to you and they'll say, oh, here, come into the fancy seat. It's not, it's kind of sneaky in a way. It's not really the point. We don't belong in the fancy seat. And the minute we understand that, that, that's a phrase that, that trips off our tongue so easily, right? There but for the grace of God. And I think a lot of our Christian journey is learning what that means. <clears throat> All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us rely on the grace of God, the forgiveness, the new life, the new opportunities that God gives us. So all of us start in the cheap seats, if you will, at the far end, away from the fancy table. But God invites all of us to sit with the people who matter, because in God's eyes, that would be us. There is a spring of living water. We don't have to build it all ourselves. We don't have to dig our own, maybe you do, I don't know, I don't know what everybody's water system works like. Maybe you actually do have to dig your own system. Good luck with you. Metaphorically speaking, we don't have to do that. God provides for us. That spring of living water is there for all of us. And Jeremiah stands in front of the, God stands in front of the court in the reading from Jeremiah and says, these people have missed the point. And not only have they missed the point, it's not just that they're wrong, they're missing out on all the the wonderful things that I want for them. And for many of us, my hope and my prayer is we won't miss it. We'll be able to really understand what it is that God offers us and we'll realize that it's much, much more than the things we can build for ourselves. Amen. Stand together and affirm the faith we share in the words of the Apostles' Creed, which you can find beginning on page 189. Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church.
sustained, and that our involvement has caused, and still causes, many good things, but many bad things. Come, Holy Spirit, creator, and renew the face of the earth. Come, Holy Spirit, come. We pray for our faith family in Newfoundland and Labrador, today lifting the parish of Salvage, the rector, the Reverend Juanita Freeman, with congregations at Eastport, Salvage, Burnside, St. Chad's, and Sandringham, and for the parish of Seal Cove, the priest in charge, the Reverend Madonna Boone, with congregations at Seal Cove, Bayward, Westport, Purbex Cove, and Lassie United Church. In the worldwide cycle of prayer, we remember the Anglican Church in Aotearoa, New Zealand and Polynesia. Come, Holy Spirit, Counselor, and touch our lips that we may proclaim your word. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, power from on high. Help us use your power to bring peace in all our relationships to advocate for justice in our society. Make us agents of peace and ministers of wholeness. Come, come Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, breath of God. Bring wholeness to the sick, thinking particularly at this time of Crystal, Florence, David, Jennifer, Dale, Alex, Lily, Pamela, Huey, and the people on each of our hearts. Supply strength and courage to those who heal and serve. Give life to the dry bones of this exiled age and make us a living people, holy and free. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, wisdom and truth, strengthen us in the risk of faith. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Lord God, the wellspring of life, pour into our hearts the living water of your grace. By your light we see light. Increase our faith and grant that we may walk in the brightness of your presence. Amen. Amen. Continue on page 191. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites them to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We stand for the peace. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And to the extent we can, without breaking too many COVID rules, we exchange the peace with those around us.
our offertory hymn and words are in the bulletin. Freely, freely. those 
in thee. In all things he fulfilled your gracious will. On the night he freely gave himself to death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Gracious God, his perfect sacrifice destroys the power of sin and death. By rising into life, you give us life forevermore. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection, and looking for his coming again in glory, we offer you, Father, this bread and this cup. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Use the first set of sentences on page 212. I am the bread of life, says the Lord. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who trust in him. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And as we have a number of visitors and new folks today, just to explain the process, you come up the center aisle, there's the little six foot markings there on the floor, stand on the X, I'll give you the bread. Then you go over to the side there where you get the little cup with the wine. And then in the, through the door there, there's bins to put the, the cup in when you're done. It always sounds much more confusing when I describe it, than it really is. The final thing, just if I pause for a bit and you're standing in front of me, don't panic. It's just that sometimes you get a bit of a traffic jam at the other end. So sometimes people look a little anxious, but I don't give them bread right away. <laughs> don't worry, it's coming. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites them to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not 
not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. And we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness. And keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We stand for the peace. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. And to the extent we can, without breaking too many COVID rules, we exchange the peace with those around us.
You made a covenant with Israel, and through your servants Abraham and Sarah gave the promise of a blessing to all nations. Through Moses you led your people from bondage into freedom. Through the prophets you renewed your promise of salvation. Therefore, with them and with all your saints who have served you in every age, we give thanks and raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes to the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, source of life and goodness, all creation rightly gives you praise. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He healed the sick and ate and drank with outcasts and sinners. He opened the eyes of the blind and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to those in need. In all things, he fulfilled your gracious will. On the night he freely gave himself to death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Gracious God, his perfect sacrifice destroys the power of sin and death. By rising into life, you give us life forevermore. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection, and looking for his coming again in glory, we offer you, Father, this bread and this cup. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Use the first set of sentences on page 212. I am the bread of life, says the Lord. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. They can see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who trust in him. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And as we have a number of visitors and new folks today, just to explain the process, come up the center aisle. There's the little six-foot markings there on the floor. Stand on X. I will give you the bread. Then you go over to the side there where you get the little cup with the wine. And then in the, through the door there, there's bins to put the, the cup in when you're done. It always sounds much more confusing when it's right hmm. than it really is. The final thing, just if I pause for a bit and you're standing in front of me, don't panic. It's just that sometimes you get a bit of a traffic jam in the other end. So sometimes people look a little anxious, but I don't give them bread right away. <laughs> Don't worry, it's coming.
I think that's yeah. Again, um, welcome, and, and uh, if you're new to us or just visiting, good to have you here. And our final, all stand. We stand for the blessing, and then for the final hymn. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn is in the bulletin, Circle Us, O God. 